أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وَأَن تَصُومُوا خَيْرٌ لَّكُمْ إِن كُنتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هُدًى لِّلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ وَالْفُرْقَانِ فَمَن شَهِدَ مِنكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ وَمَن كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرَ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَاحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِّن لِّسَانِي يَفْقَهُوا قَوْلِي وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم نور قلوبنا بنور القرآن يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى this talk is not going to be very academic at all it's going to be just some bits and pieces of the passage that I recited before you pretty much all of you I'm guessing are familiar that these ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah in the 180s are the comprehensive discourse on fasting and the month of Ramadan in the Qur'an. This is the singular place in the Qur'an that addresses the entire issue in a very comprehensive way. And alhamdulillah, with the, with the help of the shaykh, we don't have to discuss any of the rulings. I'm not capable of doing so anyway. So we'll talk about some of the other things, the spirit of this month, and the relationship between fasting and the Qur'an. So we'll do- talk about some background information and uh, set sort of a foundation for the actual ideas we want to present. The end goal of this talk eventually is to understand the relationship between the two primary activities of this month. The two primary activities of this month are the fasting of the month of Ramadan and of course the slide that you saw but you didn't get to go into detail with, the Taraweeh prayer and the Qiyam al-Layl. This is a two-part activity. And of course this is verified and authenticated in the statements of the Prophet ﷺ and in the Qur'an. You know, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ First calls it the month of fasting, then he calls it the month of standing, and the month of recitation in the night. So there, there's two parts. And it's a mercy of Allah that only one of those parts is absolutely obligatory, and the other part is optional. Right? And we've discussed the obligatory part in the first part of this session. But first and foremost, I want to take you somewhere which seems completely unrelated. And that is the dichotomy or the split within, our, within the human being himself. You know, the human being in different world philosophies, we're not even talking about Islam right now, just even from a philosophical or psychological point of view, there's this concept of an inner conflict within the human being. The Japanese will call it the yin and the yang, right? The, the psychologist will call, call it your animal tendencies. Freud will call it the ego versus the superego, right? And the id, etc., etc. The id, the ego, the superego. They'll divide it and they'll see each of these components within us, there are things inside of us, tendencies inside of us, that are at war against each other. Some people in literary terms, they call it the war within good and evil, right? These sorts of things, different themes that are used in literature outside of Islam to describe this conflict. But the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, the sacred text of Islam, they have a very unique take on the conflict inside the human being. 
So you know, but the idea of conflict, you think of conflict between other people. Two people are fighting with each other. Two nations are fighting each other. Right? This is conflict for us. But the conflict I'm going to share with you and remind you about is a conflict that's taking place inside of ourselves. There's a war waging inside each and every person. Allah Azza wa created us of two, two essential ingredients. He created our body. And our, you know, the, the first human being was created from Turab, Adam alayhi salam. And you know, when we return, Allah returns us to the very dirt from which we were created, so we are returned back into the ground. This is one part of our creation. But Allah did not just create a body made of soil and clay, and that was it. What was done after that? A ruh was blown into it. From the amr of Allah, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي so there's a part of it that is, that is made of dirt, and there's a part of it that is not made of, it's not made of dirt. Now what is that other part of us? In English literature you'll call it the soul, psychologists will call it your personality, your inner self, etc. etc. All these different terms are used. The Qur'an's term is the ruh. The term of the Qur'an is the ruh. Now some interesting things about the ruh. Allah Azza wa created it before even our bodies were created. Before even all of us were created in our physical form, in the wombs of our mothers, all of our arwah were, had already been created. And they were in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah took, there was a gathering of all of them, and Allah took a covenant from them, He took a promise from them, an agreement from them. And from that, we, from that implication in Surah Al-A'raf, this is ayah number 172 of the seventh surah, Surah Al-A'raf. From that covenant we learned that the ruh already knew Allah. So much so that it's actually talking to Allah. Allah is taking a covenant, an agreement, and asking a rhetorical question to all of us, before we were even brought on this earth. And what was the question? The question was, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your master? Am I not the master of all of you? And what did we all respond? Bala shahidna. Of course you are. Why wouldn't you be? We bear witness to that. We testified that Allah is our master before we even came here. What part of us? Our body or our, our ruh? I'm not going to say soul, I'll just use ruh, get used to that, okay? The ruh testified that Allah is the Rabb in His company. This already happened before we came here. That same ruh was then delivered to the belly of our mothers when she was expecting us. That same ruh came into the belly of our mothers. And what did it already have? What did it already know? That Allah is the master. It already had that knowledge. It already had that knowledge. Now, this is one part of us. But you know in that ayah, when Allah took this covenant, Allah Azza wa told us, why am I taking this covenant from you? So you don't come back and say, inna kunna an hadha ghafilin. That you don't come back here and say that we were unaware of this at all. We didn't know at all. We had no idea. Now you know in philosophy you say, and I know this seems un disconnected, it'll all come back to Ramadan and the Quran in a minute, or a few, <laughs> right? You have people that say, how do you know there's a God? How do you know there's even a God? What can you, how can you prove it? Your philosophy professor might be an agnost. He might say something like, I'm not sure if there is one. I'm not sure if there isn't one. What is the Muslim response number one? You already know there is one. You were already born with the belief in God. And you already believed in that God when you hadn't even come out of your mother yet. That was already there. The only difference is you forgot. You became ghafil. You forgot, but it's there. That light, we could call it the light. That light was already inside of you. When you deny that light, you have placed yourself in what then? Darkness. You placed yourself in darkness. So we were given a light that we already had. We already had a light. Now, but when we came out of our mothers, not only did the ruh come out, what else came out? The body came out too. Now, Allah created, whatever He created is dependent. The only one who is free of need is... Allah Azza wa Jalla. Everything else He created has a need. It is not, you know, in and of itself free of need. It's not a samad. He is a samad, and it's not ghani, right? It's not free of need. It has needs. Does the body have needs? What are some needs of the body? Clearly, food, nourishment, protection from the outside elements, right? And then the body de develops other needs. It develops the need to beautify itself, cover itself, etc., <laughs> etc. Et the body has needs. And you know, most people running around in the world, doesn't even matter if they're Muslim or not, they're going, running around, fulfilling the needs of what? If not the needs of their bodies, the desires, the wants of their bodies. But they're running after, fulfilling, this is what they think they are. They're so live it up. Go, you know, you, you're, you're, I don't recommend it, but you're watching TV and you see a bunch of commercials. 
What are the commercials about? Feel good, feel better, eat this, drink that, look better. All about what? Your ruh or your body? It's all about your body. Be inside this beautiful house, you look so good in it. Right? So it's all about this, this self-indulgence, this narcissistic society. In which the most important person, the, the most important concern is who? What you call number one, looking out for number one, your body. That's what it is. And you know there is now research among, uh, among psychologists, even in the West, that this narcissism, this obsession with yourself, it makes yourself so important and you set such high goals, such high expectations, that they're never met and you become really miserable and it's now the cause of depression and anxiety and even suicide. So the very thing that people ran after led to their own destruction. SubhanAllah. Now, this is the body. It has its needs. It has food, it needs food, it has desires as it grows up, com uh, you know, company, etc, etc. Now, and by the way, if, if you are students of psychology, you know the hierarchy of needs, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and self-actualization at the end, all of this is body. This is all body. But then there's another side that Allah Azza wa Jal created. That is our ruh. Is the ruh is something Allah created that is independent, doesn't need anything? Everything Allah created has a need. It's dependent. The body has needs and the ruh also has needs. Now since the body was made of dirt, it was made of clay, it was made of the materials found on the earth, organic components. All of its food, all of its nourishment, all of its luxuries, all of its desires come from where? Where do they originate from? The earth. It's made from here and its food comes from here. They all, it all comes from here. But the ruh was not made of dirt. The ruh is light that Allah sent. It was a special command of Allah that was delivered by an angel into your mother. Right? That's your ruh. If the ruh, and the ruh can also get skinny, it can also get sick, it can also get weak, right? Now inside of you there are two hungers. Your body's hungry and your ruh is hungry. But it's like having two children and you only take care of one of them. You keep feeding your body. You keep taking care of the needs of your body. Who's starving now? And eventually you know what can happen? It could just die. It could just get completely irrelevant. It's just limp. It's in, it's in a coma, okay? It's in a, when it's in a coma, what did it know? What was the knowledge that it had? That Allah is the man. What goes away then? That Tawheed goes away. Then you get the question, I'm not sure if there is a God. What has been choked? The ruh inside this person has been choked. If the ruh wasn't choked, you know what? They would actually feel, they would know. That wouldn't even be an issue. That wouldn't be a question even, okay? Now, what is the food of this ruh? Since this was, the ruh did not come from this earth, it was sent down from Allah. Its food is also sent down from Allah. That is the revelation. That is the Qur'an. The Qur'an is called, Allah calls it light. Allah Azza wa calls Qur'an light. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا Believe in Allah and His Messenger and the light that we have sent down. Allah says, believe in the light that we have sent down. What, what, what is He sent down? Qur'an. But the Qur'an is being depicted as light. But there is a light already inside of us. The one we were born with. This light now has to come into contact with the other light. And this is described in Surah An-Nur when Allah says, Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. That, that process is described in Surah An-Nur. We're not talking about Surah An-Nur today. We are, we're more talking about the relationship between fasting and Qur'an in Ramadan. That's what our talk was. It wasn't about psychology, it wasn't about the ruh, it wasn't about any of those things. Fasting, who feels it? What feels it? I don't know. First of all, when you, especially in Texas, what feels the fasting? The, the thirst, the weakness, the exhaustion, the body feels it. In other words, you've spent 11 months obsessing over your body. Allah is putting you in a training program where you start weakening what? The needs of your, you hold off from the needs of your body. Which will give what a chance to kind of revive? The ruh. You're giving it some space to grow. But this ruh, it's not just that you stop feeding one, now you have to feed the other. Right? Now where do you feed the other? At night, when you stand and you recite what? The light that Allah sent down. So you're, you're denying the food of one, weakening one, 
and strengthening the other. You're strengthening, you're regaining that balance that has been imbalanced for most of the year. You're regaining that balance within yourself. The Quran is supposed to be the food of our ruh. It's supposed to be that which we internalize this message that puts balance actually between this body and the ruh. Now, fast the ayah, the ayat we recited in the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum siyam kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum Anybody know? Tattaqoon. Okay. It says, la'allakum tattaqoon. Then he says, la'allakum tashkuroon later on. Then he says, la'allahum yarshudun later on. Then he says, la'allahum yattaqoon later on. La'allakum, la'allahum, la'allakum. All these different, so that you may, so that they may, so that, so that, so that. By the way, la'alla doesn't literally mean so that, it means maybe. La'alla doesn't mean so that, it means, or in its original form it means maybe. But when a king says maybe, like you know, you go to the, you're a poor farmer, you go to the king and says, you, you say, uh, oh king, can you give me an extension so I may file my taxes six months later? And the king says, maybe we'll let you go. The king doesn't say, I'll definitely let you go. He's so grand, what does he say? Is that enough for the farmer though, when the king says maybe? That's enough. He says, oh my God, he gave me a hint. I'm alright. This is the majesty of Allah when he says, لَعَلَّكُمْ Maybe you'll get taqwa. He's opening up the door of hope. And we understand that as so that. But it's really maybe here. And it's from His Majesty that He uses this word, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The goal of fasting has been described in this first ayah of fasting. Bottom line, so that you may develop what? Taqwa. Let's first understand what taqwa is. Taqwa essentially is a, a few components, few simple components. I'm not even going into a linguistic explanation of wiqaya and from then ittiqa and taqwa. Some very, very simple stuff. Taqwa is not fear. The Arabic word for fear is khawf. The Arabic word for fear is khawf. If you have fear, and because of that fear, you protect yourself, you take some kind of precautions, that's called taqwa. Wiqaya originally means protection. So it is not just fear, it is an action taken as a result of fear, that is called taqwa. So taqwa has two parts, the feeling and the what? And the action. If it's just the feeling, what do we call that? That's khawf. That's khawf. So taqwa in and of itself necessitates the feeling and the action. You're protecting yourself from coming into harm's way. If you, for example, get your, your, you know, your tires filled up with air, you're engaged in an act of taqwa because you're afraid the tire might blow up on the middle, in the middle of the highway. If you're locking your door at the, in the middle of the night, or you're checking the locks, you're not just afraid that they're open, you're taking an action also. You're engaged in an act of what? Taqwa. When people go to Hajj, when people go to Hajj and they should pack properly, make sure the passport is there, make sure they have extra cash, this, that, the other, you know what they're doing? They're engaging in precautionary activity, which is all taqwa. So part of the meaning of the ayah, فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادِ التَّقْوَى وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ زَادِ التَّقْوَى Part of that is have taqwa of Allah, but also take proper precautions. Now, fasting has been taught to us so that the goal you reach is you will have taqwa. Look at it from an outsider's point of view. What is fasting? It's an activity of self-control, isn't it? Not a Muslim point, from an outsider's point of view. You're holding yourself back from all this stuff. Do other people do that? Do they deny themselves things to, gain it, to get to a goal? Do people do that? When somebody works out, they deny themselves junk food? When an athlete wants to prepare for a team, right? They deny themselves sitting behind the couch, they get early in the morning, they're going around for a mile run. When somebody wants to get into med school, they deny themselves watching the movie and playing the video game, they're studying. To get to a goal, you have to what first? You have to learn to, con to hold yourself back, self-restraint, deny yourself some of the things you really want, because you want to get to that goal. It's a normal part of the process. And by the way, for a lot of people, fasting is a kind of training, even, like, you know, people want to get skinny, so what do they do? They, they, they're crying, they're looking at the fridge, some people put the sticker on the fridge, or that talking thing, as soon as you open it, stop, step away from the refrigerator. Right? <laughs> they put that on, the, why? Because they want to get to that goal. There's a goal in front of them. What is the first goal of fasting described in the Quran? Taqwa. So in other words, if you and I realize this, this is very important, if you, re, if you and I realize this, you don't run after a goal unless you haven't, uh, uh, unless you haven't reached it yet. If you have already reached it, you wouldn't be what? Running after it. What this teaches us is, if this is a commandment to all of the Muslims, 
taqwa is not something we can ever truly own. We're always gonna be have, we're gonna have to keep running towards it. Nobody can say, I have taqwa already. Can't do that. You have to work, and, and if you have, you need more. So you have to keep running towards it. So the one who wants more taqwa, will take the fasting and understand its goal. You only work towards something when you understand its goal properly. Right? Goal, the first goal Allah has set before us is the attainment of taqwa. This is the first goal. But then there's something else. SubhanAllah. When we are fed, are we supposed to be grateful? Allah provides the food, we're grateful. We do, we do hamd of Allah, shukr of Allah. The next ayah is not about fasting, the next ayah is about specifically Ramadan. So there's a difference between, you know, if you fast any time in the year, you're supposed to gain taqwa. Because the principle in the first ayah isn't about Ramadan, it's about fasting. Fasting will get you taqwa whether you fast in Sha'ban, it will get you taqwa whether you fast in January, February, March, doesn't matter when you fast, it should lead you to taqwa. That's what its goal is, that's what you're training yourself in. But then what's so special about the fasting when? In Ramadan. What's so special about that? Ramadan is special. Let's listen to Tahru Ramadan Alladhi Unzila Fihil Quran. Number one. The month of Ramadan is the one in which the Quran was revealed. The ayah didn't begin with fasting. The ayah began introducing Ramadan as not the month of fasting, but the month of what? The Quran. Okay. So the month of the month in which you're gonna deny your body is the month in which the ultimate food of your soul came down. Of your ruh came down. Isn't that true? Your food has, the, the food of your ruh has come down in this month. How is it the food of your ruh? What's the benefit of it? Hudal linnas, number one. It's, it's a guidance for people. It is, so, what does it mean? You know, you could eat the food and you could throw it up. Right? You could eat it and not digest it. Who is the one who takes this Quran and actually digests it and actually takes its nutrients? What are the nutrients of the Quran for our ruh? What's the number one nutrient? Hudal linnas. Guidance for people. Guidance, you know what guidance means? We use it all the time, it's become cliche. Guidance means when you want to do something, what should I do? Let me ask the wife, let me ask the husband, let me ask my friend, let me look it up online. But if you want to, you're getting guidance, aren't you? But now what would happen? Where would you ask first? Where would you look first? The book of Allah. Should I get married? Should I not get married to her? Should we buy that house? Should we not buy that house? Should we get into this business? Should we not get into that business? Should I keep sleeping? Should I wake up? Should I say that or should I keep my mouth shut? Right? Should I give or should I hold back? Now you, every choice you have to make, where are you going for guidance? Quran, that is an indication that you're actually taking it in. And if you're listening to Quran and reciting Quran and attending taraweeh, when it comes to guidance, you don't take it, that means you're throwing it up. You're not actually absorbing it as nutrients. Right? That's hypocrisy. Now, Hudal Linnas. What's the second thing? Wa bayinatim min al huda. Number number two. Bayinatim min al huda. Absolutely clear evidences from the guidance. In other words, not only is it guidance, the more you read it, the more it becomes absolutely clear that it can only be this guidance can only be from where? It can only be from Allah. Not only not only is your ruh testifying to this, your entire being, your intellect is in awe at the majesty of these words. You're amazed by this Qur'an. The Salah for the Sahaba, every time they heard the ayat of Qur'an, they heard a miracle. You know, for us, it would be easier if we're standing next to Musa salam and the water is parting, we're like, whoa, miracle. Right? Because it's something you could see. What is the miracle for the Sahaba? What water are they seeing part? What dead guy are they seeing coming back to life? They don't, they're not. What mountain are they seeing hovering in the sky? What 12 springs are coming out of a boulder? Nothing, no she-camel, nothing. What are they, what's their experience? What's their miracle? Quran, and the entire Quran being recited in the month of Ramadan, you are being blown away by the most clearest evidences of the miracle of Allah. Bayyinati min al-huda. And then finally, what's the final nutrient of the Quran, nutrition of the Quran? Wal-furqan. Wal-furqan. What is furqan? Uh, English translation is criterion. What that means in simple language is something that makes a clear distinction comes from farq in Arabic, okay? Or al-furuq. Farq means to have clear separation between two things. One thing is not just, you know, there are two things next to each other and there's glue between them, they look like one. But when they're clearly apart, right? The thing that separated them would be the furqan. 
Something came and two things looked like they were right next to each other, but it came and it axed them apart and they became clearly distinct from one another. The Quran comes to make clearly distinct, clearly distinct, what you should be living like, how should you not be living. What is the food of the ruh and what will, dis- what will choke it, what will starve it to death. How should you be pleasing your body? How should you not be pleasing your body? That Furqan has come down. That criteria by which you decide every matter of life has come down. Well, Furqan. At the end of this ayah, we don't find لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ or لَعَلَّكُمْ uh, um, uh, even yet لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ Let's see what we find. Allah Azza wa Jalla says لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that you may be grateful. But maybe you'll be grateful. Hopefully you'll be grateful. Remember we said when you eat food, you're supposed to be grateful? Which food has come down that we should be grateful? Food of the soul. Okay, the ultimate soul food. Not chicken wings. Okay. The book of Allah has come down and it is now going to revive what is buried inside of us. That, that, that fitrah that Allah put inside of us. The ruh that Allah put inside of us will be rejuvenated. It will be rejuvenated. And when you eat well, when you're well fed, and your health is revived, the least you should do is what? Be grateful. Now, a lot of people say, this is the last few things I'm gonna say, I'm done. I don't wanna rant on forever, okay. Here's the last couple of things I wanna say. A lot of people say, man, Ramadan is gonna be hard this year. It's gonna be so hard, right? And it's, you know, like was mentioned, the long days, you know, and I have classes, and I got work, and this and that. Right? It's going to be tough. It was so hard last year too, etc, etc. What does Allah say? He says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Interesting. In the ayah of fasting, in the discourse of fasting, Allah mentions Allah intends ease for you. He does not intend difficulty for you. It is, and by the way, بِكُمْ is early. It is especially for you that Allah wants ease. And it is especially for you that Allah does not want difficulty. If it wasn't especially, we would find يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ الْيُسْرَ بِكُمْ But we find يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ Especially for you, Allah wants ease. The people who get to fast, it is a special gift from Allah. And Allah is guaranteeing He made it easy. So if you find it hard, who should you ask to make it easy? Allah Azza wa He's saying it's a gift to you, and He's made it easy, and He doesn't intend anything hard on you at all. So the people who think they're enjoying themselves, and when they see you at work, or the Muslim cousins you have that don't fast, say, why are you so hard on yourself? You remind yourself, Allah intends what? Ease. You're the one in difficulty, you don't even know it. That's sad. You know, it's like the sick person, the diabetic, who's like eating lollipops and chocolate cake and all that stuff. They're not supposed to eat that stuff, right? And when you say no, and you're diabetic too, you say, no, I'm, I'm gonna stay with that stuff. And he says, live a little. It was like, I'm, I'm trying to, you're trying to die fast. <laughs> you're dying a lot, but I'm living a little. <laughs> right? It's a twisted mentality. Now here's the last comment, inshallah ta'ala, and I'm done. There is even a relationship between fasting and marriage. The month of Ramadan is also related to marriage. How so? The discourse in Surah Al-Baqarah, when it came to marriage, isn't about marriage, it's about divorce. If you read Surah Al-Baqarah, you keep going, their entire passage is dedicated to what? Divorce, so when marriage fails. Interestingly enough, Allah didn't just tell us the ruling on the spouse. You may not have intimacy with her, you may have intimacy with her in the middle of the night, not in the days of the fast, at night. But then Allah added something that wasn't necessarily associated here. Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahunna. I can expect maybe this will be in Surah Al Nisa, maybe this will be in Surah Al Tahreem. The, the surahs that talk about the marital relationship and the blessings between husband and wife. Where did Allah place this, this amazing principle? They are garment for you, they are clothing for you, and you are clothing for them. Where did He put this? In Baqarah. In Baqarah. Why? So we learn something here. There's something special about marriage and your spouse and Ramadan. How are, you, are your spouses? You know, generally there are talks given about Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lahuna in a general context. This is not that occasion. I'm talking about specifically in the context of what? Ramadan. Your spouse comes to you, did you read Quran today? Your spouse wakes you up for Fajr. You wake her up for Fajr. Don't get lazy, Taraweeh is coming. Don't eat too much, you get sleepy at the Taraweeh and then you're gonna come back early. Right? You take care of the kids and I'll go pray and I take care of the kids and you go pray. You have to tag team. 
They cover for you, you cover for them. Kind of like clothing. Covers you and covers them. You understand? So there's, there's, there's actually hints being dropped that this month of fasting will become even more beautiful if there's cooperation between who? The spouses. And this, when you cooperate with each other in like, you know, there are some things, they, these therapists, they offer marital couples that are having trouble, they say, why don't you guys do Legos together? Or like f solve puzzles. Do activities that are shared. It'll get your conflicts out of the way. This is the, you know, you pay them $500, I'll give you this therapeutic advice, marriage counselors, right? They'll say, you know, play chess together, or play video games together. And if the wife beats the husband at the racing game, like, you know, uh, whatever, need for speed, 75, right? Then the husband throws the controller, walks off. This didn't help. <laughs> what is the activity in which you should be cooperating? That will make your marriage beautiful to the point where you will describe your marriage as she is libas for me and I am libas for her. What is that pro project? That is the month of Ramadan. The fasting in the day and the qiyam in the night. Usually what ends up happening, the husband by the time it's maybe like iftar is like 8.30, by 8.20, hey, what's, what's the iftar? What did you do? Oh God, there's nothing here? You know, and this just, it just gets nasty. She spent, she's fasting too. She spent her whole day cooking and you just go off on her. And instead of Ramadan becoming a time where your marriage is fortified, it gets even worse. It goes from bad to worse. So you have to learn these lessons from Allah's book. That Allah is dropping us these beautifully placed, beautifully placed. Take it as an opportunity to become closer slaves of Allah. And when the husband and the wife are good slaves of Allah, and they cooperate with each other in slavery to Allah, guess what? Now you will have a righteous family. Now you're ready to raise your children properly. When the husband and the wife are in conflict, forget the religion for the children. Forget it. That's not going to happen. Illa masha'Allah. So may Allah Azza wa make us take full advantage of feeding our arwah and reviving the iman that Allah blessed us with in our fitrah, reviving it by means of this revelation. The, the, the only difference, I mentioned the only difference between us and Sahaba, they could taste the miracle. They could, they could hear the message. Most of us when we hear Quran, we don't know what's being recited. So what you have to do to compensate for that is one more thing. Okay, I said that's the last thing, but this is so critical, I have to mention it. You have to compensate. You can't just stand and listen to Taraweeh. You have to read Tafsir. Better, you have to attend Dars Al-Quran. You have to attend. Your Imam is offering Dars, attend it. I know Shaykh Abdul Nasser is going to be after Witr, he's going to be doing Dars Al-Quran every night. Attend that. I'll be trying to do something of a Dars Al-Quran in Irving Masjid every night after, after the Witr. Late night. If you can, attend it. But if you can't, download MP3s. You know, uh, Suhaib Web has a great Surah Al-Fatiha series. There are a bunch of tafsir lectures out there. Start listening to the explanation of Qur'an to compensate. The Sahaba didn't have that because when they heard it in Salah, they already understood it. So we have to, we have to fill that void. Because if you don't fill that void, you'll be standing there in Salah going, oh. God, when was the last ruku? Are we at 16 or 14? <laughs> right? As soon as the Salah is given, is this 16, 14? <laughs> right? That's not what you want the taraweeh or the prayers to be reduced to. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us take advantage of these days and these nights. May Allah accept the Ramadan for all of us. May Allah help all of us find the, the Laylatul Qadr in this month and make it a means of the forgiveness of ourselves and our families. May Allah forgive all of our shortcomings. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.